Jai Hind and Puttand and Nalvarthagal. I have to say that because I am in Chennai and in conversation with somebody with whom I have been waiting for a long time to sit down and have a chat. Guru Murthy sir, Namaskaram. Namaskaram. Thank you for your time. I am happy you are in my office. <laughs> and I am happy to be in Tamil Nadu and also at the occasion of uh, a festive occasion across the country. Let's start from there. If our festivals are similar, Guru Murthy sir, and on the same day, across various country, uh, various parts of the country, they are celebrated. So, does this idea of a nation, is this not something which has been handed down to us over centuries? Or is it only the RSS that thinks of us as a Hindu Rashtra? You see, most people do not know if there is any geography in the whole world which has been defined as to its borders. And the inhabitants are defined as to what they are. It is India. You take any Purana, there are 18 Puranas. In 7, Bharata Varsha is defined, 7 or 8. In Brahmanda Purana, it says that in the north it is Himalayas, in the south it is the three seas, in the west it is Devanas. In the east it is Kiradas. The nation in between is called Bharat Varsha and the people inhabiting this land are called Bharatiyas and they believe in karma and rebirth. Hmm. So India is not a new idea. Hmm. India has been a self-renewing proposition. Correct. In fact, I would like someone to read the history and culture of Pakistan in Pakistan government website which is not allowed to be downloaded here I have read it, I have downloaded it talks about Takshaka as their forefathers Takshashila University where Kautilya taught where Chandragupta Maurya read where Ashoka was a student and how Kautilya and Alexander had a conversation hmm. and he asked about how you can invade a country simply because you have a big army that's not our culture. Hmm. We give notice to the other side and he explained the, our concept of war. And of course he orders his arrest and he escapes and he finds that we have a new kind of enemy to face and that is how he structured the new concept of Arthashastra. Arthashastra. Where he moved away from what Mahabharata would say as the Dharma Vijaya hmm. to Lobha Vijaya. Lobha Vijaya. That is, acquisitive war is necessary to build empire. Before that, we never had the concept of acquisitive war. Now, I will go to four persons hmm. whose credentials cannot be questioned, who have endorsed this concept. Okay. First was Aurobindo. Hmm. In his Uttarpara speech, he said very, very clearly, Sanadana Dharma constitutes the foundation of Indian Hindu nationalism. Hindu nationalism and Sanadana Dharma are one and the same. If either of them can perish, India can perish. Yeah, Nobody can it. dispute Aravindu. Hmm. He was no RSS man. He had no agenda against anybody. He had a global vision. Correct. He saw humanity as one consciousness. Why the Indian political thinkers can't discuss Aravindu? Because if they discuss Aurobindo, they cannot practice dishonest politics. Then you come to Mahatma Gandhi, who wrote that uh, famous Hind Suraj, hmm. which was an imaginary conversation between the reporter and the editor. He doubling as the editor and the reporter. The question that was put to the editor by the reporter Gandhi, to the editor Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, what are you saying? We are one nation, one country. It's all the Britisher who through their railways and post office turned us into one nation. And you talk about uh, India as a nation and all that. To which Gandhi gives the simplest explanation. He, is, he doesn't get into great uh, complex uh, theoretical formulation. He looks at the practical situation in India. He makes three points. One, he says that uh, the British could turn India into one government because it was a one nation. One nation. Very simple explanation. Second thing he says, that our forefathers, 
knew that uh, you could worship God in your own home, in yourself. Hmm. You don't need a God outside. You certainly don't need places of worship. But they established these char dhams hmm. and they made Ganga such a special aspect of our civilization. A Ganga at home is considered to be something precious all over the country. And people move in millions from one place to the other without any but he disturbing them, actually people receiving them. Hmm. And in this sense, we were one nation in the sense in which no two Englishmen are. Can you question Mahatma Gandhi? Yeah. There was no RSS then also. There was no RSS. RSS, was, RSS did not ex propound anything. Hmm. I'll come to it. Hmm. Then the, the, the reporter Gandhi didn't leave the editor Gandhi like that. Now, Muslims have come. Hmm. You, what you are giving is a Hindu explanation. What about this? He said, introduction of a foreign religion does not alter the character of a country. We must have the capacity to assimilate them. Assimilation is the sense of nationhood and democracy. Without assimilation, they cannot be either a nation or a democracy. Then you come to Pandit Nehru. In his glimpses of world history, which is one of the most contemplative literature that Jawaharlal produced. It is not one of those evening letters. Hmm. He said that uh, it is not possible to draw a line between Hindu nationalism and Indian nationalism because India is the only country of Hindus. Very practical way of looking at how you align a nation and people on a territory. <coughs> this was sometime in the 30s? 35. 35. 1935. Hmm. Then he goes on to say, Swami Vekananda expounded the articulated powerfully, he uses the word powerfully, powerfully, the concept of Hindu nationalism, which is not against anybody. He accepted the concept of Hindu nationalism as not being against anybody. anybody. This is somebody may think it is against them. But Jawaharlal Nehru did not think it was against anybody. Now you can see broadly the uh, Congress and the freedom fighter school of thought hmm. accepted this. Now you go to uh, Rajni Palme Dutt, hmm. an Indian brought up in England and who formed the British Communist Party. He wrote a book called India Today. It was uh, published in 1939 and it was revised and published in 1973. He didn't change one word in it. Hmm. And I must say even Mahatma Gandhi, after because it was the Sin Swaraj was so heavily criticized by including Nehru. He wrote in 1929 and then in 1939 when the ban was lifted. It was, it was kept banned between 1909 and 1939 with the British government. It was only during the war they lifted the ban. Then Mahatma Gandhi said, I have read and re read it. I don't want even a Kamar full stop change it. See, this is how nation builders think. They don't change their opinion okay. from election to election. Which is advantage is not advantage. These are some eternity they see in these thoughts. And Rajni Paul made that 1939 he wrote the book. 1973 it was uh, republished again. He said, you see, at that time the the uh, criticism of uh, the Indian uh, freedom movement by the British is that it is we gifted the freedom movement to you. Hmm. We educated you. You got the idea of freedom through us. Otherwise, you would have continued to live hmm. as slaves. So, for you to become a free country, we are the source. To which he writes a critic. Hmm. He criticizes this and says, Gentlemen, let us assume you had not taught us English at all. We would still have got the idea of freedom from the isolated Vedapadashalas and the Vedas and the Upanishads would have given us enough ideas and slogans for freedom. This was Rajini Palmezat in 1939. Do you see any different ideology 
communist ideology, a global ideology, not rooted in this country, assessing India differently from either Vekananda or Arabindo or Nehru or Gandhi. Gandhi. This was a settled position in India. So what changed? And nobody disputed it. Everything changed on one event and that was Jinnah passing the resolution for partition in 1940 in Lahore. Everybody dropped the word Hindu and ran away. RSS did not. In fact, RSS was very much thick in the, in the thick of the freedom movement. In 1931, 30, when Dr. Hegewar, who hmm. uh, went to uh, jail for a year and came out, the person who presided over the function, public reception was Motilal Nehru. There was no difference. Let's look at what's happening in Tamil Nadu. Now, if this is the land of Subramanian Bharati, this is the land that talked about nationalism, that talked about, and Bharatiyar, despite the kind of criticism that he felt, there have been huge amounts of national pride examples from, our, from this land. What is the current situation today? Why is the RSS facing so much opposition that you have to get a reprieve from the Supreme Court to conduct marches? Or to conduct your sabhas, public talk, meetings. Why talk about Tamil Nadu? Why don't you talk? This was the position all over the country. RSS fought against this, inch by inch. Its battle was calibrated. One of the most successful, democratic, peaceful battles since it was banned in 1948. And like any organization, RSS has its own plus and minuses. I am not saying there is no human organization which can which can win the approval of everyone. everyone. Mm. For example, even when uh, Rama was born in this land, he could not get the approval of everybody. Yeah. Because human mind will always be able to find an argument against you, however great you are. So I am not defending RSS. But one thing is, the core idea it represented was left to RSS only. Mm. What the Congress did was the most foolish thing that it handed over the pre-independence agenda to the RSS. So the RSS picked it up, had conviction in it and generated strength, public opinion and the first breakthrough was uh, 1967 hmm. when the Jansang formed uh, political alliances with parties which would normally not associate with the RSS. Hmm. And then in 1975, the uh, anti-corruption movement Java and, and a person like uh, um, Jay Prakash Narayan saying if RSS is uh, fascist, I am too fascist. Hmm. So this kind of thing began changing the discourse. So you can see the movement for or against RSS was political. Even in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, is it political? No, I am talking about the country as such. I am... I'm, I'm, where I'm, the RSS had greater strength. Correct. But I am in Tamil Nadu, we are in Tamil Nadu, so yeah, I have I'm to coming, ask you. I am ah. coming to that. So it is the Ramjan Bhumi movement, hmm. which was aligned with the core idea of uh, India as a Hindu uh, country or a Hindu phenomenon as the identity of the country. That aligned politics and... Hindutva. Hmm. So when Hindutva was made the uh, ideological mascot of the BJP and the and the political parties challenged it, then the Supreme Court had to see the truth. It is not the Supreme Court gave a, a political judgment. It gave a judgment looking into what is Hindutva. Hmm. That it, it it quoted all literature. 1976, its own judgment that a, a Christian member can be part of a Hindu undivided family because Hindu is a civilizational cultural term. Hmm. So what all the polit politicians tried to keep aside was accepted. The gradual uh, validation and mainstreaming of uh, the idea of Hindutva, Hindu nation occurred in 90s. Hmm. All these are foundations. These the struggle that uh, we are undergoing in Kerala and Tamil Nadu is like the struggle that the 
in the whole country the rss underwent in the 70s 80s hmm. and 90s hmm. it's not something new hmm. so it was a gradual realization and there was no violent revolution so it has now come to a stage where it is very difficult to say that there is no hindu element in the idea of india hmm. you may you may not like it but if you cannot seriously dispute it hmm. and it cannot be invalidated because this has not come about through any constitution amendment like socialism and secularism correct this one now come to tamil nadu tamil nadu has a very special uh, character because it is here the british experimented the intellectual division of india hmm. you know uh, e v ramsam naikar had been part of uh, the freedom movement yeah. in fact today only he wrote about him in the tuglak that he participated in the vaikam satyagraha and all that he ran a self respect movement from 1975 but in 1944 he formed a party dravidar party why in 1944 because jinnah had already asked for partition so he formed a political party in 1944 asking for partition of the dravidian states only to ensure that there is enough trouble and confusion for the freedom fighters and in making this country one so the idea of uh, the dravidar party is political it's not cultural it's hmm. not civilizational it's not ethnic but you are also saying it's rooted in secessionism it's rooted no, in separation secession, secessionism <coughs> is because like uh, the british promoted uh, the muslim league you know ah, so let's when, leave when, behind a split nation or know, a split when when, when when the seat for partition was laid many people do not know it was in 1937 when the all india sharia act was passed hmm the long title to the act says this act is being passed on the demand made by the all india muslim league leader mohammad ali jinnah have you ever seen a law saying this and it says that all muslim shall be governed by sharia law and all properties other than agricultural land will pass according to sharia law <laughs> why agricultural land because given the choice between agricultural land and islam the jat or kurmis <laughs> would rather prefer <laughs> agricultural, agricultural land. land you know this was a political this is this is not a religious proclamation but a political okay. proclamation to divide india but uh, till the time of kamaraj and uh, even at that time see rajagopalachari you had uh, sarvapalli radhakrishnan you had great thinkers great leaders statesmen <laughs> various voices who hailed from this part of the country and i'm just taking a few names there are so many other names who have come from here why were they not able to intellectually convince the people here Same. how is it that this entire narrative has moved away so much that today anything to do with hindutva is scorned upon and the outright narrative is that you are a, when they say about rss and the biju they are hindutva forces and hindutva is wrong so this hindutva bashing is not just a global agenda it's become an agenda here also no i i, I have mm. a, a different view of it ji you know in tamil nadu actually the fight the the division of the congress in 1969 and earlier the divide between kamaraj and raja ji mm. resulted in validating the dmk the dmk's validation by raja ji in 1967 was the reason why they acquired legitimacy this was a political wrong by raja ji which he quickly understood hmm. but it was too late by too then late by because then. mrs gandhi had divided the congress and one section of the congress associated with the dmk yeah. in 1971 weakening raja ji and kamaraj together so we handed over the political platform to the dmk and then the admk but i can tell you one thing the word hindutva is politically unacceptable but if you look at any state all states in india if there is one most hinduized state it is only tamil nadu you know the kind of people thronging to temples here 
you know for uh, the pioneer hmm. kavadi it used to be 10000 people 30 years ago one year in in a year hmm. now it is 3 lakh people every month and a million people every year and for shabrimala nearly a crore of people go hmm. and tamil nadu has completely become religious so much so both the dravidian parties are now following the religious minded people of tamil they have to identify with them their ideology is gone the anti hindu anti religious ideology of both the, uh, all the dravidian parties is gone that's a very big statement that you make because yeah i see i'll tell you in 1960s there was a complete alignment between the society and politics both were anti north anti hindu anti hindi anti religious hinduism was sent away from tamil nadu in 1960s today the society is hindu politics is dravidian hmm. it is because there is no challenge to them like you know in kerala there is hmm. no communist hmm. but there is the people challenging the communists are also pseudo communists the same ideology same this thing so the political polarization is only around who can capture power next time and be with them Correct. so it requires a wider movement to make the people's uh true feelings to reflect in politics mm. that is the direction in which tamil nadu is going mm. today whatever is happening in tamil nadu is like what happened in the country in 1950s and 60s mm. i may not live to see it. maybe in another 10 years you will see a completely different tamil nadu but for that you need to have ground leaders you need you need to have a ground swell there is no leadership amongst the dravidian parties Mm. you are thinking there is leadership among the dravidian party these are derived leadership mm. these are leadership conferred leadership mm. so i feel no great future for the dravidian parties mm. there will be a huge political upheaval in tamil nadu when a bjp kind of party rises because most of the youths have stopped joining the dravidian parties mm. which they have themselves acknowledged in like 2016 Uh, if i remember right stalin said youths are not taking to politics, politics. i only said they are not taking to dmk dmk many believe that the there is this reluctance and this hesitance to believe in india because they don't see a possibility beyond narendra modi so they say it's all happening because he is there at the helm once he demits office if and whenever it happens what next see this question was always asked about india mm. by the west and those with western mind in india mm. will whether india will lost after nehru mm. what after nehru you know this is all because they all look at this country through a prism which has produced their history you look at india from 1989 to 2014 we didn't have one leader except the uh, period of vajpayee mm. we had such rickety coalition but india was not threatened india's integrity did not depend on or, or get eroded by political fragmentation this shows india is a strongly one country that we have a hidden desire to live together you know this is not the feature of any other country mm. 89 to 2014 we have 11 prime ministers and governments so i am fundamentally india's unity and integrity is assured mm. second thing is whether there is a leader that would depend on the bjp as an organization you know congress produces leaders through the families bjp produces leaders through its Rank own process hmm. but my view is who expected uh, uh, a person who came from the congress like hemant biswas sharma to do so well hmm. who expected amit shah to do so well who expected a uh, uh, um, uh, yogi to do so well these are all potentially that is the leadership can be thrown by the bjp but today's leader cannot be a leader of only india hmm. he has to be a global leader 
so we are now in the league of electing people who cannot be merely content with being leading india we have to lead the world so they are agree you. with you whether india can produce a strong leader or not is independent from whether it can produce a leader of global standing that's a challenge that i accept but i think india can produce a strong local leader local leader but you say that the the transition or the continuum has to be about global leadership global leader. not just local Why leadership is the political discourse has also to change change i agree finally uh, something that we uh, very strongly articulated and spoken on my show on the right stand is about the culture quotient there is obviously the counter narrative which says oh this is rssizing or the hindutva agenda is there you are trying to brainwash the generation you are trying to impose religion and scriptures on people the other thought continuum is vedic knowledge vedic gnana is perhaps our own heritage we need to bring it back so where do you stand on this see this all is uh, this is how discourse starts this is how debate starts till now there was no debate at all at least there is a debate starting take for instance yoga hmm. 25 years ago yoga would have been purely a communal phenomenon today yoga is a global phenomenon so if india has to influence uh, its people to the indian way the battle is at the global level hmm. five nobel laureates of science have said they find answers for quantum mechanics from vedas and upanishads they are not fools this is the answer five nobel laureates yeah. you must teach the young that this is the view of the nobel laureates it's not some mp mla or some mullah or some church or shankaracharya this is something very different we have not adequately positioned the indian civilization in the mind of the indian people and that is why we have this uh, this difficulty in making our own ideas palatable to our own people so i am of the view with the open communication this 5% is actually a legitimization process that this is legitimate mm. this was considered illegitimate in india it is not that this is going to greatly promote but this is legitimate to that extent this policy is welcome but this is going to revolutionize and all that is not something which i agree because it will again depend on the uh, soul of india manifesting in variety of ways which i have seen do because 40 50 years back we were all spat upon hmm in spite of being a very uh, uh, important figure in india a corporate consultant of high standing people always treated me as an untouchable we have moved far away from that position so i'm sure that we will continue to progress because the world is sliding as compared to uh, where we stand because they have no central philosophy to run the world on that very positive note on this very festive day i uh, thank you very much for your time wonderful conversation thank you sir uh, i'm just going to take one promise from you that we've got to do this more often okay thank you, <laughs> thank you very much thank you.